Hello, everybody, and Merry Christmas to all. Today, it is December the 24th, 2023. It's Sunday. My name is Carrie Holzman, and thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope, most of you, I hope, I have the day off tomorrow, regardless if you celebrate the holiday or not. At least you get a day off, I would hope. And, of course, the spirit of giving, if nothing else. Uh, time for people to uh, just take a day off from the conspiracy theories and the paranoia and the hatred towards other, other humankind and just take a day off, relax, and try to enjoy the day. And that's what it's really all about from my perspective. Now, because uh, it is sort of traditional to not work on Christmas Day, at least here in the States, probably worldwide, but uh, some of us, of course, in, in positions where we have to work, uh, we certainly salute you for your sacrifice and your families who have to be without you. We really appreciate your dedication to your trade, whatever that may be. And uh, today I want to do a review for this TerraMaster NAS device because it is so inexpensive. There's almost no reason why anybody who desired one couldn't afford one brand new nowadays. Now, kind of gone to two extremes here. Uh, the, this is an entry-level NAS device with two bays, and you can put any size drive in it you want. All the way up to the biggest drives they make available right now, which are the 22 terabyte drives. So I went ahead and did the opposite, right? I, I bought the cheapest NAS, but the most expensive, biggest drives are the most expensive ones for consumers. But I bought them refurbished, which takes them down a good 30, 35% off the normal retail price. So this whole thing, everything you're about to see today is under $800 for a total of 44 terabytes of storage, which is mind-blowing for, you know, well under $1,000. So I wanted to present that to you for your consideration, especially if you've never owned a NAS before. I would not go and buy the most expensive or nicest one until you've familiarized yourself with it and determined how useful it is to you. For most people that get a NAS, they may not know exactly what they need it for other than storing some files, but then they quickly learn they can't live without it, and it usually isn't long before they want more bells, whistles, and features for, for things like uh, access from other places. And, uh, you know, for example, our good friend Mitch likes to use his NAS for listening to his music, creates his own Spotify, if you will. When he's traveling, he can use his cell phone to connect to his NAS at home and be able to listen to his music or his video library that he can watch anywhere in the world that he has a cell phone connection. And it costs him nothing. Once you make this investment, you're just paying your monthly internet bill as you normally would, and now you can use it for that much more. Now, I've never used this unit before. It's a brand new unit, and I'm looking forward to exploring it and discovering it with you. Hello to all my friends out there in blue. I see a bunch of badges in the chat room. Our good friend Buster, Peter Laycock, with a super chat contribution of 10 pounds, says hello, Carrie and Marlena and everyone in the chat. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Buster. Back at you, my friend. And uh, hope you're doing well. I, I imagine it's cold and rainy in Scotland. Buster joins us all the way from Edinburgh. And Planet Gryos with a $5 super chat says, hello, everyone. Carrie, howdy. I am one of those that have to work today and tomorrow. How fun, LOL. Well, uh, I hope they're paying you well. And uh, I admire your dedication to your craft. And uh, let's see, who else do we have? Hello to steve mercure you know what i'm going to use this screen over here because i just realized i am squinting really hard to see that screen oh this is so much better i probably should use this since i have it mortant joins us as does luke greenia luke thank you for your contribution by the way i missed it yesterday my apologies i didn't check the phone uh thank you as well to um it'll come to me tom jackson Thank you so much, Tom, for your contribution as well. There's Bryce Hosking saying hello, and Thomas T and Gil Garcia all jumping in saying hello, Dan Nilsson and John Struthers. Mark Gaines joins us from Northern Ireland. Always good to see our friend Mark. 
Randy Roblowski says hello, as does Paul Garrett, and David Graham, and Mark Gossman, Avery Ramsdorf, and Terry Trena. I see Acronis is back in the chat room. Love it. If you guys have any questions during today's show about Acronis, take advantage of them being in the chat room. And uh, thanks again to Acronis joining us for our Acronis show on Friday. That was uh, that was fantastic. So nice to have them in the chat room. Actually, to have him in the chat room. <laughs> That's our good friend McGowden. Ryan joins us with a $5 Super Chat contribution. Says, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff H. says hello. Gary McCraw says hello. Eugene Adago says hello. Troll McTrollington saying hello as well. Colin Hammond says happy holidays from Saratoga Springs, New York. Johannes Young Craig says Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas back at you. Peter, Peter Meyer says Merry Christmas. Oh, man, it looks like everybody's in a, in a great mood, which is a great way to start the show. I'm going to start off by just showing you TerraMaster's website. It's always interesting to see how the companies promote their own products because nobody should be able to present it better than the manufacturer, right? Uh, thank you to Steve Mercure with a $10 super chat just now. He goes, this is to help you and Camera Girl buy some eggnog. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> And Don Walter says hello, as does Garfield Rupe. Welcome in, everybody. Jim KJ3N also joining us. Jeff H. Welcome in, welcome in. And uh, John, you here? Huh. As soon as I took my glasses off. John Fury says greetings. Yeah, I can't, when the, with the I and the R and the I all lowercase, it kind of looks like an N. I'm trying to figure out what was happening over there with my, got to change my font. All right. Uh, Galloway Harvey says, hey, welcome in, Galloway. All right, so I want to go over to the website for TerraMaster. And we'll see what the, how the manufacturer is uh, promoting this. As I mentioned, these videos are live. They're unscripted. Everything's done in a single take. And there's no rehearsal. There's no script. I'm not paid to make this video. Um, everything you see is to replicate what the average consumer would do when they order products. A lot of times, most people just tear it out of the box, get it hooked up. They're super excited and anxious to use it. Oftentimes, instructions aren't looked at till long after the fact. So I try and follow that same routine because I want to emulate your experience. If you were to buy one of these, I want you to know exactly what you should expect so that you won't have any blindsided, uh, unexpected experience. So let's go over now to my window capture. Here we go. So this is the TerraMaster. They call it the F2-212. It's a two-bay NAS. You see it's all black. Some of the other TerraMasters are silver. It's got a quad-core processor. It says it's an updated version of the previous F2-210 entry-level NAS. In comparison with the previous generation, it's equipped with a more powerful ARM processor. That's the V8.2 Cortex A55 64-bit 1.7 gig quad core. That's a lot for just a NAS. It's got built-in floating point unit and Neon SMID engine. It's got one gig of DDR4 RAM. It's got video DSP hardware acceleration, also boasting more powerful 4K video encoding and decoding capabilities. It's adequate for home document backup and providing multimedia entertainment. Actually, it could do much more than that, but they're being modest. The operating system is their new TOS 5, which adds more than 50 new functions and 600 improvements compared with the previous OS. The new features meet more business requirements as well as significantly improving response speed security and ease of use. Well, we'll see about that. Now, for most of you, you'd use this as a home data center. As you see here, it supports up to 22 terabytes of hard drive. Now, I suspect that limit is simply because that's the biggest available. I imagine that limit will go up as more larger drive capacities become available. I don't think that that's a, a hard limit in the machine itself. But that's neither here nor there today as we make the video because you can't really get anything bigger than that. 
So it will hold a total of 44 terabytes if we do this in a RAID 0 configuration. It can store 15 million HD photos, 9 million working documents, 20,000 HD movies. I want you to think about just how much capacity that is. Have you seen 20,000 movies in your lifetime? Also, it could hold 2 million downloadable music files, enabling you to back up uh, your data in Windows, Mac, mobile phone, or your hard drive enclosure, uh, over your network, right to your NAS for centralized management, meaning everybody on your home network could have access to what's ever on there, movies, documents, music, um, what have you. This is what I traditionally use, a device like this for my business clients that are small business clients with fewer than 15 or 20 employees. It's a lot cheaper than a server. And uh, we don't even use any of the applications. We just use it as a, a shared media storage. So everybody has on all the computers, a what we call a Z drive. And I map the drive letter Z to the NAS. So no matter which computer you sit at in the office, when you look at your installed drives, you'll see you have a Z drive and everybody's Z drive all points to the NAS and that's where they can save and share documents for the business. Now, it also serves as a media center, right? So we don't use this as a media center in business. However, you could, for home use, use this to decode and encode uh, 4K video and have your own universal plug and play DLNA server, which is for use in things like Plex, for example, maybe one of the most common. It can stream videos in a variety of multimedia devices, including smartphones, tablets, Roku, Apple TV, Google Chromecast, Apple Fire TV, uh, even directly to some smart TVs delivering users content while having reliable entertainment experience. You can become your own Netflix, basically, when you're streaming to yourself. As you can see, the drives are very easily accessible, as I believe any real NAS shouldn't require any tools to take it apart and take the drives out. The whole point of a NAS is to be able to uh, have an, an easily accessible device where your data is stored that it can be quickly repaired without you know, having to take the thing apart. They, they do sell people, there are companies, that do sell NASs. And if you look carefully, you'll see them for sale that the drives are inside of and require disassembly to get to the drives. That really upsets me because to me, that defeats the point of having a NAS. So as you can see, the drive should be easily accessible without any tools. You just swap a drive out, especially if you're in like a RAID 1 array, you don't even have to turn the unit off and it rebuilds the missing data all by itself. Now it won't do that if we're in 44 terabyte mode. But if we were to take the two, two, 22 terabyte drives and put it in a RAID 1, what that essentially means is anything that you save to the one 22 terabyte drive automatically gets saved to the second 22 terabyte drive. And you have a total of 22 terabytes of storage available to you to use. And that's all you can see. The device hides the second 22 terabyte drive from you while it mirrors any deletions, additions, or changes happening on the drive. If either drive fails, you don't lose anything. You just simply swap the drive out with another 22 terabyte drive. It rebuilds and you're right back in business with no loss. On the other hand, if you want to do RAID 0 and get the 44 terabytes, if either drive should fail, you lose everything because half of your data is on one drive and half of your data is on the other. And that's true of all NASs and all RAID 0 arrays. So, um, Choose wisely, which is more important to you. There's something that Terramaster has called T-Raid, and that's short for Terramaster Raid. It's a flexible array management tool developed by Terramaster that features the automatic combination of disk space, hard drive failure redundancy protection, and automatic capacity expansion. All these functions do not require manual configuration by the users. And the system automatically completes the configuration according to the properties of the hard drive. T-RAID provides users with an optimized, flexible, and elastic disk array of a management solution, especially suitable for new users who are not proficient in how to configure a disk array. So sometimes when we talk about this stuff, we're using language that people aren't familiar with, and it might cause your eyes to glaze over. 
But a NAS is very simply network attached storage, N-A-S. And all it is, is like having an internal hard drive that everyone on your network, even on your cell phones, can all optionally, they don't have to, optionally have access to. So imagine how you could use that in your home or however many devices you have, tablets, cell phones, uh, Fire TV or Roku's or even smart TVs to be able to stream your own media. Imagine making your own little video with your phone, put that on your NAS, move it from the phone to the NAS, and now that video is available to all devices on your home network. Even potentially while you're away from the home, you can play your videos anywhere where you have an internet connection anywhere in the world. It supports uh, mainstream file services like SMB, NFS, SFTP, FTP, AFP, iSCSI, WebDev, WebDev, and provided with multiple permission management of users, user groups, and folders. That means that you could configure this to require a username and password. If you wanted to add to the complexity to this, you can do that so that if you wanted to give the kids access to a bunch of media that's kid-friendly while blocking them from um, adult materials or non-kid-friendly material on the NAS, or even just adult stuff like your taxes and spreadsheets, you can essentially uh, assign access based on the login credentials of what they're allowed to see and what they're not allowed to see. It's got both the ext4 and btrfs file system that are supported. Now, uh, ext4 is very old. I don't like it. You should definitely be using the btree file system or Butterfuss btrfs. It's much faster, more robust, and uh, much less susceptible to corruption. They've got uh, data protection, and of course, every NAS now, since the uh, whole QNAP debacle with uh, ransomware attacks of NAS devices, typically these NAS devices, you turn them on, you leave them on, and they always have access to the internet 24-7. So it's always important you keep your NAS operating system updated, just as I say the same with Windows OS, because it's not that you necessarily click on anything. And, and a NAS is a good example of that. Just having it on and connected to the internet, if it's not properly secured, can give an attacker access, do whatever they want to your data. They can erase it, they can encrypt it, and then charge you money for the decryption key. So it's, in order to keep the bad guys out, you want to keep your updates current on anything connected to the internet, including your smartphone. If your smartphone has an update, I recommend you grab it ASAP. Of course, they have a bunch of backup solutions like Time Machine from Mac, as well as uh, the ability to backup to cloud storage or to be your own cloud so that you don't have to pay services like Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive, or you could be your own Dropbox. All right, and I realize this gets more complicated the more I go on, and you don't have to worry about that. If you've never owned a NAS before, just set it up as a SharePoint for everybody to access. When you get really comfortable with that and realize it's no big deal, then you might want to explore the next thing you might find useful, such as backing up, um, uh, cloud access from uh, while you're away from home to your data. It doesn't have to be movies or music. It could be your business files. It could be you have a document with a bunch of your passwords in it, which I hope you've encrypted, and then when you need your passwords, for example, and this is a terrible example, by the way, but you could then theoretically access your NAS, pull up that document and get a list, you know, while you're traveling, while you're away from home. Uh, you can see everything that's connected to the NAS. And we'll get more into that. And it says it's a simple and fast installation. So we're going to verify that right now. And of course, they have a bunch of third party applications that you can download to further increase <laughs> your reliance on this device because trust me once you get used to using these third-party apps that take care of a lot of things for you and make access so much more convenient you're gonna have a hard time living without it it even has photo management which is really nice if you uh, take a lot of photos and you want to be able to uh, search photos very quickly or if you have you know thousands upon thousands of photos and you want to display them on your TV or 
display them on your phone again as you travel around the world. They're all available to you at all times. And if you drop your phone or lose your phone, you know, you're not paying for photo storage. Docker is a whole nother world of possibilities, which I won't get into today, but certainly something we can revisit and nothing I would recommend for a beginner. And it's a two-year warranty on it. Now, over at Amazon, you'll see this thing sells for just $169.99. That may be the cheapest two-drive NAS I've ever seen. People mention about building their own NAS, recycling an older computer and putting free NAS or true NAS. Or... There's a couple others out there. I think it's a massive waste of time. Uh, I, in my opinion, this is going to be less power consumption, more reliable, take up less space. Traditionally, it'll be quieter, be cheaper to run, and it's specifically designed out of the box to be used as a NAS. It's not like you're taking something that's a generic one-size-fits-all and then forcing it into your shoebox of, okay, you're going to be a NAS today. I think we all know that when you buy a device that's specifically built to do a task, it is almost universally better than one device that does a bunch of things. In my experience, the one device that does a bunch of things doesn't do any of them particularly well, whereas a specific device that does one thing is more than likely going to do that one thing far better. It's faster to set up. It will be, in most cases, cheaper. And you've got a warranty, which a lot of times you're not going to have if you're repurposing an older computer. Also, if you're going to repurpose an old computer, you need a keyboard, a mouse, a monitor, all that. With this, you just have two, two plugs. Plug it into your network and you're gonna give it power. That's it. Everything's accessed through a web page. So $169.99 is an incredibly good price for what you're getting here. And I can tell you that without even looking at it, without even testing it, that's a good value. Now, the drives, as I mentioned, I got these 22 terabyte Seagate Iron Wolf drives. It's important you buy hard drives that are built for NASs. Otherwise, you might find that uh, some NASs won't accept them and other NASs uh, will end up failing much earlier. You'll have more drive failures. So getting a drive such as the Seagate Iron Wolf Pro series of whatever capacity you want, in my experience, leads to Ultra reliability. I have not seen a failed Iron Wolf Pro yet. I've got two Iron Wolf Pro 12 terabyte back at Studio A that I installed, what, four years ago? They're still running strong. And for all my clients that I'm running NASs, they're all running Iron Wolf Pros. Nobody's had any failures. Knock on wood. Now, these drives are normally over $400 a piece, but these are renewed drives. You see here, renewed. And they're sold and backed up by Amazon. So you have your full, I think they even extend the 30 days. I think they go 60 or 90 days on these. You won't know that they're used. They're going to be fully packaged like a brand new drive. And I don't even know that used is a proper term because these drives have got a double inspection. Whereas the regular drives that you buy go through a standard quality control test. These drives go through a second quality control test thoroughly, even more thoroughly inspected than a brand new drive. So think about that. 300 bucks is a great price. I cannot stress that enough. Out of curiosity, I know that uh, our good friend Planet Cryos recently bought two 22 terabyte drives. You remember what you paid for those? Hey, there's Frankie B in the chat room. Hello to our good friend. Hello to our good friend Frankie B. Acronis says, I wonder if TerraMaster would be interested in an OEM partnership. Hey, you guys should explore that. There was some discussion a while back. The last time I was at, uh, Acronis had a, uh, a party, if you will, a celebration uh, over at the Fountain Blue Hotel in Miami. They flew me out there to cover it, and they were showing off prototype NAS devices that had a Cronus already baked into them. And that was a couple of years ago. I, I haven't followed that, but I would be very interested to see how that's developed. But that would be so cool to get um, 
a network appliance that already has a Cronus in it. Okay, so these are the drives I bought, $299 each. It's a heck of a bargain. As you can see, compared to the price of the drive here at $169, I'm paying twice as much for each of the drives, but I should only have to buy it once and be good for many, many, many years. Now, if you want the full length, uh, I don't know what the Seagate warranty normally is. You'll need to buy the new ones to get the full factory warranty. But again, I've been using renewed drives, uh, not for my clients, but for myself personally. And I haven't had any failures yet. I haven't had any anything bad go wrong. Planet Cryo says uh, he thinks he paid $399 a piece for essentially the exact same drive. So it's a heck of a savings, basically a hundred bucks off. Morton said, this NAS would be nice to back up my Synology NAS. Well, you know what? When you have a large capacity NAS, how do you back that NAS up? Use another NAS. The problem is if that NAS is located in the same building and something happens at the building, like a fire, a theft, a flood, you've lost everything. So ideally you have your backup somewhere else. And when you're using a lot of data, so if you're one of those people that has a 22 terabyte NAS and you're using 18 terabytes of it, the best thing you can do is copy the 18 terabytes locally first, because that'll be much faster, although it'll still take a long time. Then take that second NAS, put it off site somewhere and just have it synchronize any file changes over your internet connection, assuming your internet connection is good enough for that at both locations. Food for thought. Let's open it up and see what we get. My thanks to the folks at TerraMaster for sending us the unit for review. I love how affordable it is. This isn't like a PC where we talk about an eight year lifespan or a 10 year lifespan. These have essentially a lifespan until the operating system no longer can be updated and then you run into security risk. So even though they still work, um, after a certain number of years, when the operating system no longer will function on these, through a series of updates, they become more robust or they have more um, robust requirements, the units become more susceptible to hacking. They still work 100%. You could open this up and use it 30 years from now. It's probably still going to be just fine. But likely, no operating system is going to update to that unless you replace it with a third-party operating system, which my understanding is with TerraMaster, you can totally put Unraid on there or, or other uh, software. You don't have to use the TerraMaster software. Now, I strongly recommend you do, especially if you're a novice. Putting your own RAID uh, or NAS software on here is far more an advanced user activity. Do know that it's possible. So in the box, here's what it looks like. We've got the NAS unit itself and then our box, which will have our power adapter and cables. One of the easiest ways to get things out of a box is to open it and turn the box upside down. Save yourself the effort tomorrow when you're unboxing your presents. Remember your tip. Remember that tip from your Uncle Kerry. This thing is super light because it has no drives in it. bring this up to the camera and show you nice and close up what this looks like. Again, I like that it's black. The other TerraMaster we reviewed last time was silver. I don't have anything silver that matches it. So for me, aesthetically, it's not as pleasing. Black is a bit more universal. The complaint I've had from customers is they can't see the power button. Hey, where is it? In this case, I don't even see one. That looks like a remote sensor or something there. These are our drive bays. TerraMaster on the side. You're going to have just the one single Ethernet port, which is fine. That's all I ever use, a USB 3, a USB 2 in your power input. There's your power button hidden in the back. 
quite frankly, these are meant to just stay on. So it's not like the power button should see frequent use. And obviously, when it's put up front, front and center, uh, it's a lot easier to find, but it also implies that you're going to be turning it on and off a lot. For the most part, the only time these go off, in my experience, is when we lose power. Um, got some rubber feet on the bottom, some ventilation, and it's ready to rock and roll. All you have to do is add your own drives. So I'm not quite sure how these open. A lot of times there's tabs or you push it in. I seem to recall on the uh, Amazon page they were showing. Yeah, here we go. Push that in and just pull it out. There's your drive tray, which is completely tool this. So we'll take that out. And then we'll take that one out. And there's not a whole lot in there. Pretty simple. I think a lot of people um, that have these, and you know who you are, never dust them. And you can get a lot of dust buildup in here. And what I recommend is at least once a year, just like with your PC, I recommend you blow these things out with canned air or a duster of some kind. A leaf blower is probably a bit much. Uh, you know, I use that rechargeable air blower, which you can get on Amazon. They're like 50 bucks, 60 bucks. And you will be surprised that at least I was surprised at how much dust these things can hold, especially in the back where the electronics are. So I get an air duster like this that's a fully rechargeable lithium ion battery. I double click the trigger for it to stay on. Blow the unit out, preferably take it outside to do that. Obviously, you want to turn it off first once a year. And that'll keep it running nice and cool. The dust acts as an insulator and will make it run hotter and hotter and hotter the more you continue to neglect it. So your choice, it's your stuff. All right, let's set that here. Let's get this out of the way. Now, in this box right here, very light box, we have a wall wart. That's our power adapter. They've given us, uh, looks like a six foot ethernet cable. They've given us some stickers. They've given us some screws if we want to secure the drives, which I don't recommend because it makes replacement more complex than it needs to be and they're just totally unnecessary. And we've got some documentation and warranty information. And that's all that's in this box. So we'll just put all that away because the only thing we need for right now, of course, is Power adapter. Can I help you? Did you need something? Check my email, she says. Okay, well, let's get this plugged in first and we'll do that next. So I'm gonna just step around here and we'll plug this in. And of course, if you're watching in another country, make sure you get the version if available, that has your country's plug type. And we'll plug this in in the back. What are you smirking about? What, 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 what changed? You have no problem interrupting me before. <laughs> you can interrupt me anytime. Oh, Morton sent a $200 Amazon gift card. Wow, thank you so much, Morton. He says, Merry Christmas, Carrie and Marlena. There's $200 for the channel. Thank you for another great year of content. And that's from Thomas. Thank you so much, Thomas. That's very generous. We, uh, we ended up having to default back to the credit card for the big year-end, what did I call it? The, the big build... I can't. Yeah, we've got a build coming up. No, no, no. We've got a build coming up where I'm doing an AM5 build. And it's going to be sort of an over the top build. So I want to make sure that I've got an over the top cooler and over the top cakes and over the top power supply and over the top storage and over the top RAM. 
And that's going to be our year-end build. And my very first AM5 build. I even ordered one of the... Uh, um, and I think they're a waste of money, but the plates that are supposed to prevent flex, what are those called? Uh, I can't think of what it's called. I've ordered one just because it doesn't hurt to have it, and they're 10 bucks on Amazon, and they're supposed to prevent flexing, which I think is all a bunch of... It's all a bunch of hoo-ha, because quite frankly, the engineers who design this stuff if they thought that was necessary, they would include it in order to reduce warranty calls. And since they're not getting a lot of warranty calls, it just goes to show you that there's a, a segment of enthusiasts that cares about this little technical minutia and will pay, in my opinion, way too much money for this kind of stuff. Unless you're overclocking, really no need for it. Um, I'm trying to think what the plate is called. Now I've got to look it up because it's going to bug me if I don't. Company named Thermalrite makes them very inexpensively. And essentially, it replaces the CPU frame. Now, what cracks me up is they make these in different colors. But when you put your CPU cooler over it, you're never going to see it. Um, but it's supposed to prevent the, inter the um, integrated heat sink from bending over time, which I just think that's it's unlikely to happen unless you're really overheating your CPU over a long period of time. But essentially what it looks like, you would be like, what is he talking about? They have these plates. And essentially this replaces your CPU socket. Completely remove, well, not the socket itself. You leave your CPU in the socket. You know how you see me lower that lever and lower this retention plate down over the CPU that presses it down onto the pins? Well, that comes off. You unscrew it and replace it with this that sits on top of your CPU. And then you have to tighten this very carefully because, again, you want to make sure that it itself isn't warped when you put it on. So you have to sort of go around each screw, uh, doing opposite corners, tightening it as evenly as possible to ensure the flattest possible service. So, um, if we go to AM5, you'll see that they make a version of this. This is what I ordered here for our upcoming live mixer build which we're using a 7950X3D, I think is the chip I ordered. And again, the entire surrounding area around the socket comes out, this replaces it. So in some ways, this is way more complicated than it needs to be. Changing your CPU out is, you know, instead of removing a lever, now we have to unscrew and remove the plate. Um, but on the other hand, it's supposed to reinforce the area around the CPU to ensure that there is no bending. And the bending we're talking about, you couldn't even see it with a human eye when it happens. It's so subtle. But sometimes that little bit is what it can take for um, improper contact with the cooler, resulting in overheating. Again, this is really extreme and I'm not recommended for your average user. If you want to add it just because it's fun, have at it. But as to any actual performance benefit, unless you're overclocking, I wouldn't waste your money. So we bought that. We bought, oh, we found a red all-in-one cooler to go with the red motherboard. Anyway, it's going to be outrageous, and I hope you'll join us for that. That'll come up uh, this Friday. All right, where was I? I was prepping. I was prepping this, getting this ready. Morton says it's called a contact frame. Yes, that's exactly what it's called. Thank you again, Thomas. Uh, boy, I couldn't find those words. That's a, it's called a contact frame. All right, let's get this out of my way here because I got more mess to make.
So when you order these re renewed drives, they show up in a box like this, very similar to how a new drive arrived. When you open it up, you'll see it's packaged in much the same way as a brand new drive. Generally speaking, in my experience, if you're going to have a problem with the drive, you know, you might be hesitant because it's renewed, it'll usually be right out of the box. If it works properly out of the box, it's probably going to run for as long as a brand new drive would run. Get out the scissors and you see this is completely sealed in the anti-static bag exactly the way a new drive is. But you will see it has a slightly different label. It has a renewed label on it, which in my experience has a green border. If you see a green border around the label of a drive, it usually implies that that's been refurbished or renewed, depending on the language you want to use. And you will see it says oh, it's a recertified product. And of course, we want to make sure that we get SATA drives normal SATA drives. We don't want server drives. And to install the drive in a very similar way, um, well, this is interesting. There is a, a, a plate here. This mechanism comes out. And that's going to hold the drive in for us. But what I just realized is one is missing. Right brand new out of the box, it's missing. This one has both. So we'll start here. Now, this is not a deal breaker that that's missing. I uh, don't know how that happened. But we're going to write to TerraMaster. And if this should happen to you, don't freak out. Something like that is a very easy problem to solve. They'll very, very happily mail you a new one. And there is a little arrow indicator, which I think is indicating forward. And I think I just put it on backwards. And now that I've removed them all, I'd have to rewind the video to see, but let's see, does it go on this way? There is a little lip on it, right? Camera? No, I'm just trying to get this to, there it is. You see, it's got like a little lip on it. And then there's a little slot right there. And that lip goes in the slot. Oh, I'll get that in a minute. Let's try this one instead. My hands are full. I'm guessing. No, I think I had it right the first time. I think, I think the arrow goes to the back. Yeah, so the arrow goes to the back of the drive. And you've got to have the drive completely flat. I'm screwing this up six ways to Sunday. The good news is you can't put it in the wrong direction, right? So that's what we can take away from that. And so, yeah, when you have that little lip on it, the lip is going to go towards the back. Forget what I said earlier. These videos are live, unscripted, and unrehearsed, so I'm just making assumptions half of the time, and when those assumptions are wrong, we find out really quickly. <laughs> now, it is a little concerning that this somehow got packaged without the other piece, and I just want to double, double check in here that it didn't fall in there, and there's really nowhere for it to go. So it looks like it got through quality control somehow with that missing piece. But I'm going to show you something here. We'll go ahead and remember that this goes in. If you look at where the connectors are on the drive and you look inside and see where the connectors are inside, you'll know that this connector has to face down. It can't be in the up. It won't seat in there. Also, if you remember how this came out, it doesn't matter if we put this drive in the first slot or in the second slot. They're all created and treated equally. And then it should sort of click once we put it all the way in. And then we'll repeat that with the remaining drive. Now, ideally, ideally, 
we would have both of those, uh, both of these to secure the drive. However, in most cases, when people set these up, they put it on a shelf or on a table where, um, where it isn't going to be moved or, or, or uh, bumped, things like that. So in all likelihood, not having that drive with the other piece isn't going to prevent us from using it, but it's a good practice to have it just as it's supposed to be there. Better safe than sorry kind of a situation. So um, again, a, a simple email or a phone call to the folks at TerraMaster and they'll mail us that. Surprising. And I'm sure when I let them know I didn't get the other one, they'll be just as surprised as I am. Now, the other thing, remember, they did give us screws. So we could secure this drive with the screws rather than using these quick disconnects. Now, if I was worried about, you know, shipping this, I wouldn't ship it with just this one, only because the drive may put undue pressure on the connector. You know, once this is slotted in, then the SATA connector inside is really what's going to be holding the drive rather than these um, support. I don't know what these are called. As you can see, these are brand new. They've never been tested. So everything we do here being live is again to emulate what kind of an experience you should expect if you want to order and replicate what we're doing. Planet Krios with a $5 super chat said he has yet to add the 22 terabyte drives to his Synology. He's thinking about getting a second one for off-site backup, like he said. So he's got the 22 terabyte drives and he's not used them. I've been guilty of that, but really you're, you're going to, you're going to love when you have those 22 terabyte drives and you're going to wish you'd have done it sooner. Look how tiny the circuit board is on these drives now. Remember when they used to take up the whole thing. All right. So again, we can put screws in here. They did include screws. I'm not going to use them because I feel like just this one is really going to be enough. It's not going anywhere. And you'll see I put it on the side with the connector just to make sure that that's not going to budge because that's, that's our point of contact. Now, the only concern that I would have is that these drives can vibrate and it could sh shake loose out of here or potentially uh, damage itself through vibrating while it's in motion, while it's working. But there's not a whole lot of room for it to vibrate once it's in here. Nonetheless, when you order yours, you should expect to have four of those, not three. That's very bizarre. Let's get rid of this. And we'll fire this up for the very first time by hitting the power button back here. I hear a fan, very quiet fan. And I'm starting to hear the drive spin up. Let me get these boxes out of the way. So without a keyboard, without a mouse, without a monitor, how do we configure this? Well, that's what I'm going to show you next. So once you've got your drives in, very simple, plug it in, turn it on, and give it a minute to initialize. Do we have any lights on the front of this thing that indicate what its status is? Yes, there are three lights here. I think one indicates drive one, one indicates drive two. The other, I believe, indicates power. And I need to plug it in to our network, which I forgot to do. And it's beeping at us. We got three beeps. Let's plug that into our network. And that's going to obtain an IP address automatically from our router. And again, this is our very first power up ever on this device, live on camera just as you would do it at home. So 
So that's why I have the small PC up. This unit is on a different network for streaming our video. And so for this network here in Studio B, I have a separate network. So for that, we'll switch over to this mini PC. This is a, an HP Elite Mini that's a 10500 CPU. Don't confuse these with the ones we give away to people in need and veterans. Those are Core i5-6500Ts. This is a Core i5-10500T, so it's four generations newer. Quite a bit faster and quite a bit more expensive. You can get these up to a 13700, Core i7-13700. I think anything beyond that, they get too hot. I think that's why they don't go above 13700. I'm, again, speculating. I could be completely wrong. All right, let's go now to our HDMI input, which is the desktop here. And let's see. Here's my mouse. We'll bring up a browser. Did I not plug this into the network? Uh, I did not. All right, let me go back to camera one for a second. I thought I had set this up prior to the show, but as you can see, this network cable right here, this needs to get plugged in to our mini PC. So this has network access and this has network access. I had initially neither one of them plugged in to the router and as such, we're not gonna get access. Duh, rocket science, right? Who knew? Let's go back over to that computer now and uh, let me go full screen so I can see this. All right. Show this recommendation again. Edge is so annoying. All right, but we're just going with a stock install here on this mini PC so I can use it for demos like this. And so once we you know, go through our initial setup, we got to get rid of these annoyances that have. Now, how do we find the TerraMaster on the network? There's a couple of different ways. Um, I could refer to the documentation. However, I'm going to go to the TerraMaster website under download. So we'll look under TerraMaster download and they're going to have a utility that you can download that will find your NAS on your network for you. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. Apparently that is not a good search I just did. Let's do Google. I realize I typoed, but I'm so used to Google correcting my typos. I can't be bothered to correct them anymore. What a difference. Where to download the TerraMaster desktop app? That's what we're looking for. We'll go to support, download, and we actually have a 212, but I, we don't need anything that specific. The, the application that will uh, locate your TerraMaster works with all the TerraMaster drives. Under desktop and system, the desktop assistant. Now this is for Ubuntu, this is for Mac, this one's for Windows. It's a small file. We'll go ahead and download that. Mark Gaines contributes five pounds, wants me to check my email. And while we do that, I guess I could put myself up in the corner. So let's put the camera back up and we'll minimize me right up here. All right. Holy cow, Peter Laycock with an extraordinarily generous PayPal contribution. Hello, Carrie and Marlena. This is just a thank you for everything you've done this year. Your friend, Buster. Wow. Oh my gosh, Buster. What an incredibly generous man. Thank you so, so much. Um, speechless.
A $50 Amazon gift card comes in from Mark Gaines joining us from Northern Ireland. Thank you so much, Mark. He says, I'm wishing you and Marlena a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you too, my friend. And our friend Frank Jimmy with a $25 Amazon gift card says, Dear Carrie, I thoroughly enjoy your YouTube channel and I appreciate all the information and knowledge you share in this wonderful community you've created. I look forward to more great content as we head into 2024 and beyond. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And again, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you, to all of you. And thank you so much for your continued generosity, your support. Again, a thank you to, uh, I see, Mortant and Netfreak sent Amazon gift cards, as did Frankie B. You guys rock. And I can't say thank you enough to each and every one of you and all my members and all the regulars who join us, member or not, who join us and are part of this amazing community that we've created here online, which is in my opinion better than any of the content i make it's just the value of this community and the and the support that's shared amongst us all including you know getting to know many of you um in, in, a, in a much more connected way than just avatars now um my download should be done So we'll click on open file. Yes. Just go with the defaults, let it install. We can close the browser. Finish and it's gonna run this automatically. Do you want to allow? Yes, obviously, if we wanna be able to find it. And there you can see this is the application running and you can have more than one NAS. You can have as many as you want. And it's going to find them all. So it's been assigned this IP address. Can we just double click it? No, right click. No. Uh, where's the. Oh, it's still. I have to wait for it to finish searching. I guess that's why it's. That's why it's not letting me double click it. Peter contributes $2, two euro. In Super Chat. Thank you, Peter. Merry Christmas, Carrie and Mara Lena, he says. Merry Christmas to you, Peter. Let me switch over to Gatorade here because my Coca-Cola is getting a little warm. And there's nothing worse than warm Coke other than maybe cold coffee. I got a chuckle from that one. I don't know. I think all coffee is disgusting. It smells great. It just tastes terrible. Mara, on the other hand, thinks coffee is the elixir of life. So there is that. All right. Uh, 96%. Okay. Completed. Now can I double click it? No. So that wasn't the problem before. Right click. Nothing. <laughs> I was hoping this would be more obvious. Uh, am I using the right mouse? I am. Wake on land is disabled status. Uh, okay, so we're going to edit. No, I don't want that's, I guess, changing the IP. That's refresh. What's this one do? Uh, apparently, that's the one I need to press. Okay, now remember these drives I just put in, they're not partitioned, they're not formatted. So no matter what NAS you have, the software has to load. And a lot of times, whether it's Synology or TerraMaster or QNAP, it just has enough of uh, software built in that it goes out online to their servers to download the actual NAS software, which is too large to fit on the um, internal CMOS or firmware that they have. So we're gonna hit start. And that's going to warn us that it's going to erase the drives, right? Using an incompatible desktop hard drive, in other words, not a NAS drive, but a regular hard drive, or an unhealthy old hard drive is likely to cause a slow response, drive drop, system crash, or RAID crash. We already talked about this. 
This may lead to total data loss. There's a hard drive compatibility list. You can look at it if you want to. As long as you get an Iron Wolf drive, you should be fine. Or the uh, Western Digital Reds. How do you want to initialize? Default or custom? Now, if you're new to all this, I'm going to say go with the defaults. I don't know what the defaults are. Default adopts the default configuration, which is relatively simple and fast and is suitable for ordinary home users. This option requires your TNAS to be connected to the internet. Custom requires step-by-step -step settings and takes longer, and it's only recommended for professional users. Well, let's do the default to keep this as simple as possible. So we'll click default, and then that way we'll see what the default settings are anyway. Now, it does warn us, this is the earlier warning I thought we were getting, but now we get it. That we're, it's going to erase these drives. If you are using used drives, do know that if you set them up in a NAS, you're going to wipe them completely clean and reinitialize them for NAS use. Because these are brand new, we don't have any worry there. And now it's going to install the TerraMaster Operating System, or TOS. And it does say the system will be ready in about 10 minutes. And if the installation gets stuck and cannot be completed, your hard drives may be faulty. And so that's the first place they want you to check should this process freeze up on you. Now, this is going to take about 10 minutes. And while we're waiting, we'll just go back over to the chat room here and see what you guys are saying. Richard, with a $2 Canadian super chat, says, Merry Christmas, Carrie. Hey, Richard, thank you so much for your super chat. Merry Christmas to you, my friend. <laughs> Acronis said he starts liking Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee recently. It's there's a that's a little bit of a poke with a stick for Mara because there's a Dunkin' Donuts right around the corner from Hello. Studio B, and every time we drive by it, I always forget it's there, and I see it, and I go, "Oh, I should go in there and get a donut." Yeah, for like two months you've been saying that. Yeah, I should stop at Dunkin'. Is that what I sound like? Gee, I can stop it, dunk it. Wow, that sounded just like me. Just go already. <laughs> so she's getting like, what is wrong with you? Just go in there and get a donut. Get this out of your system. Besides, if you go, I'll get coffee. But here's the thing. When it comes to donuts and coffee, there's Starbucks, there's Black Rock Coffee, there's Dutch Brothers. There's all these places you can get coffee. And here in Arizona, we have Rainbow Donuts, Bosa Donuts, all these other donut places that I've forgotten all about the old school Duncan, right? That's from back in the 70s and 80s. Now it's like, kind of feels old fashioned. I want a modern donut. I don't want one of those old fashioned. Anyway, uh, we drive by it. It's kind of a joke. First of all, I don't need a donut. Not exactly. Nobody needs a donut. Not exactly good for my waistline. <laughs> However, one donut isn't exactly going to change that unless I get addicted to them. Right. <laughs> But I feel spoiled because I think that Bosa Donuts, Rainbow Donuts, these other donut places, I think, bear in mind, I'm completely ignorant on this because it's been probably 20 years since I've stepped foot in a Dunkin'. I think they have better selection. Also, you know, what's better than Krispy Kreme? And they, once I you- I don't eat donuts. But so once, you've, once you've had Krispy Kreme, like to me, that's the best. Right. Well, there is a place over by Studio A called Alicia Donuts. And it's like a small, I think, Korean family that runs us. And they're like, for like, I think it's like they get started at four in the morning or five in the morning. And it's like they're there until like 10 at night. And it's seven days a week. I mean, these people work their butt off. And a donut's like 75 cents or some ridiculously <laughs> cheap. I don't know how they're making any money. Anyway, they melt in your mouth. They're so delicious. I think they're better than Krispy Kreme. But anyway, I have- Well, quit yakking about Dunkin'. <laughs> so this mention of Dunkin' Donuts is funny because every time we drive by it, since I know it gets under her skin and I'm going to get a reaction. See, if she wouldn't react that way, I wouldn't do it. And I go, oh, oh yeah, Dunkin', I forgot that was there. I need to go in there. And it's been 20 years since I've been in a Dunkin'. I wonder what, what their donuts are like and what variety they have. She's like, for the love of all that's holy, would you just go in there already? <laughs> Planet Cryos with a $2 super chat says he has to go. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you, Planet Cryos. And, and uh, I hope you have a good day at work today and tomorrow. And Merry Christmas to you, Mike. Gregory Howard with a $10 super chat says, Hello, Carrie and chat. I hope you all have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. 
Gregory, back at you, my friend. Thank you so much. Cronus says he's going to try Starbucks. He was gifted with a gift card. Dutch Brothers he's never heard of. Maybe they don't extend to Florida yet. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure where they're from. Probably Oregon and Washington is typically the source of a lot of the famous coffee places. Tim Hortons. Yeah, Marlena, when we were in Michigan, I had Mara try Tim Hortons because we don't have those out here in the West. I'm just looking through to see if I missed anybody's comment, uh, super chat. Steve H., I think I missed yours. With a $10 super chat, Steve says, Hello, Carrie. I'm sorry I haven't been watching the last couple of months. I went back to work to pay for holiday bills, but keep up the good work and Merry Christmas. Hey, Steve, we're here 24 7. You can watch us at 2 o'clock in the morning if you like. You just don't get to watch live, but um, we're glad to see you here in the live chat. And thank you so much for supporting the channel. And, uh, Hey, nothing wrong with going back to work. I support that. That takes me back as far as I can go. Ryan says they have Tim Hortons in the USA. Oh, yes. Yes. But just not on the West. All right, and this is all happening real time. And I think this is important to show you exactly what to expect if you decide to get one of these and you want to go through this process yourself, that when they do these polished, edited videos, they do all this in like a split second. And I think that gives the viewer a false expectation of what's really involved and how much time you need to set aside. That's not to say you need to set aside your day, but... You do need to set aside a reasonable amount of time for your download and installation and configuration. And so plan accordingly is what I'm saying. If you just watch the polished edited videos, you'd think all this gets done and snap of fingers. And when you look back on it, it might feel that way. But going through it, it, it does take a, a realistic amount of time. And uh, I just, it kind of bugs me when I see editors or uh, people that are producing videos that it, they don't even put down how much time has elapsed that they've cut out or they might you know say we've sped up the video but in the meantime it doesn't really give you any idea of how much time has passed so by doing it in real time it doesn't get any more genuine and authentic than what you're seeing here on this channel some people feel like well i don't have the time but at the same time if you don't have the time then maybe you don't want one of these because you're, there's no way you can fast forward life. I mean, unless you're in a coma. Douglas Burchell says Denny's has the Graham Slam on sale right now for $7.99. All right. Uh, Riot says they, he loves Denny's Grand Slam. We don't have those in Canada. Apparently, we're talking about Denny's now. Steve Chappelle says, good afternoon from North Carolina and Merry Christmas. Well, thank you, Steve. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, Akronis, that's Bogdan, and he's from Russia. His wife is from the Ukraine, and they're the nicest people you will ever meet. And... Baga is the most knowledgeable person I've ever met on Acronis. They recently, I believe, got their American citizenship and are living here in the States. And so all these things like Krispy Kreme and um, Starbucks, they're all new to him. So he's got this whole new world to explore. I'm kind of excited for him. I wish I could <laughs> live vicariously through his first experiences because... Uh, you're about to get your mind blown, my friend.
Bog is also a big guy. So if you're ever walking down a dark alley in a bad part of town, you want him by your side. <laughs> Nobody's going to bother you. Oh, he says they're not citizens yet. All right. Well, you keep us informed on that so we can have our own little celebration. Because I know that's on the way. He's also got a really big dog, a Great Dane. Everything in Baga's world is big. <laughs> He's a big guy with a big dog. Uh, and that dog is just... Ah, uh, just looks like a lover. Looks like a really friendly, smart dog. Of course, I've never met a Great Dane that wasn't super friendly and big-hearted. Okay, so now that it's installed the operating system, or at least it's downloading it, now it's processing, meaning it's going to be partitioning the drives and setting it up so that we can begin our configuration with the TOS. So much like installing Windows 10 or any version of Windows, you go through the download process of the installation files, the preparation of the drives, the partitioning, the formatting, then the actual operating of, um, installation of the operating system, followed by, you know, when it's complete, an empty OS that's fully configurable. Empty meaning, you know, it's just got bare minimums installed for any applications. Configuration is very generic. And you'll notice when I get done installing Windows, oh, I change a bunch of things to my preferences. And we're going to do essentially the same thing, only we're using TerraMaster Zone. But the same concept applies here. Cronus says the, what's the dog's name? I've forgotten his name. He said he learned to abuse people's desire to pet him. <laughs> That's a smart dog right there. They'll give you the eyes. Yeah. Great Danes are, the only downside about having a Great Dane is they have a pretty short lifespan as far as like typical dog lifespan is. So they're never around long enough, you know. Odin, yeah, what an appropriate name. The great dame named Odin. Well, especially, if you've never seen him, have you? Yeah, you got to see him. He looks like an Odin. Well, you just wait till you see him. Uh, yeah, I should have you uh, send us a picture of Odin. Of course, I'm a, I'm a dog person. Mara's a cat person. She's one of those crazy cat ladies. And it doesn't help that we now have a stray cat coming over to Studio B, which I want to check and see if he's... Is he here? He kind of shows up around dinner time. Not exactly sure why. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know why. Because we feed him, so he keeps coming back. And because Mara's a cat person... She wants me to get him, like, healthy cat food, expensive cat food. And I'm like, he's a stray cat. He eats out of the garbage can. You give him anything, he'd be happy to have it. No, I can't give him the expensive stuff. Well. See? Hey, the stuff we're giving him, just giving him canned food for crying out loud. He's a stray cat. He can eat <laughs> kibble. Dry cat food's good enough. It's not good for their teeth or their jaw. Being stray isn't good for their teeth or their jaws. Well, I'd like to bring him to my... Take him. He's all yours. I'm... Yeah. Good luck picking him up. You're going to get the murder mittens. Okay, after restarting, the system page will automatically reload. If it does not, then of course, uh, search again and connect again, just as we did the first time. So we'll wait for this countdown to complete. And it should automatically bring the login page, which will require us to set up a username and a password. Peter says, I am also a cat person, and he works with cats. I don't think anybody works with cats. I think you work for cats. Ah, Acronis has posted a picture. There's a link 
in the chat room. Oops. Come on, Carrie. Doesn't he look like an Odin? Wow. Yeah, he's, uh, what do they call it, Harlequin? Wow, he's beautiful. Huge. I don't know who these people are. Uh, let's see. Share that with everybody. There's Odin the, the Great Dane. <laughs> That's a great picture. How'd you like that when you knock on somebody's door? Have that greet you at the door. He's a monster. A friendly monster. And I imagine probably a goofy one. All right. Thank you for sharing the pictures. He's appeared in, uh, in Baga and I have talked in a, a live, sort of like a Skype session. He's kind of poked in and said hello. <laughs> Douglas says, that's a big head. That's a big everything. Mortant said, dang, he's big. Yeah, he is, well, a great Dane. You know, that's, that's why they put the word great in front of it. Here's one more. That's hilarious. Look at this guy. They'll do that too. Great Danes and Dobermans are really tall dogs. It's like they'll sit with their back legs on a couch, or in this case, a bench, while still keeping their front paws on the ground, which is hilarious. I always find that funny. Look at that face. If I could zoom that in. Look at the face. All right, I digress, but I just bide my time as we wait for this. Uh, Install to finish. Okay, let me go back full screen so I can read what it says here. Tips to increase system security. The root user has been disabled. You're about to create a super user for the system, which is equivalent to the root user. Please set a strong username and password for the user. We strongly recommend you don't use super user in your daily operations. Create another user for service settings, application management, data backup, etc. Confirm. And here we go. Let's close that out so it doesn't distract us any more than we're already distracted. We can give the device a name. We can leave that default for all intents and purposes today. Username. We'll say carry. It's pretty unique. And for the password. I'm just typing an entire sentence out. Security email. I'm going to leave that blank. 
but you should definitely put your email in there. Arizona. Can't receive the verification code, skip verification. Skip verification for now. Warning, data on drives will be deleted. Are you sure you want to? Finally, congratulations, your NAS device is now initialized. Please save this important information. So username Carrie, that's our password. This is our TNAS ID that comes in later when we're trying to access online. You can configure advanced functions or install more applications by accessing TOS on the computer. To access TOS, either enter the following IP address in your web browser. Oh, it doesn't say either. It just says enter the following web address. Now, this IP address, if you're going to turn off your router and turn it back on or turn off the NAS and turn it back on, please know that the IP address may change. So, otherwise, it should stay the same. Here's your, of course, our end user license agreement, which everybody, of course, fully reads and understands, right? Of course we did. Sure, why not? And confirm. So right now, see, I have no idea on the default settings how it configured our drives. Are we in a one? Are we in a zero? Are we using ext4? Are we using btrfs? Now look, if you're a novice user, if you've never set one of these up before, these are sort of advanced questions that want to be caring about once you know what all this stuff means and advantages and disadvantages and as they apply to you and your unique values. Now for me personally, I want this to be in a RAID 1 configuration, meaning that one drive mirrors the other. If I want all 44 terabytes, I'd lose any redundancy, which means there's no backup unless I make one. And you have several terabytes of data. It can be very time consuming to make a backup of it. However, by going into a RAID 1, even though that's not a true backup, it does help us if we have a data corruption or hard drive failure. It does not help us if there's a fire with after flood, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it's not a true backup. Most common reason people need uh, their backups is primarily on site due to drive failure. Uh, otherwise, you might need a, a backup if, for example, you got infected with ransomware and you don't want to pay for the decryption key, you could simply restore your backup. In this case, because one drive is mirroring the other drive, if one drive gets encrypted, immediately the other drive gets encrypted too. It literally duplicates everything that's happening. Just like a mirror, it's going to reflect everything that it, it shown to it. So everything that drive one does, drive two repeats it. So that's where you would need an off-site or disconnected backup to restore from. And the more data you've got, well, the longer and more discouraging it is to make that backup. A lot of times people will use a second NAS, especially if you've got a ton of data. Uh, or you can use like a USB drive. If they make a USB drive big enough, to hold the amount of data you have. So in this case, if we're set up as a RAID 1, we'll have a total of 22 terabytes, and we can buy a 22 terabyte USB drive. But if we go to RAID 0 and we have 44 terabytes, well, obviously if the biggest drive they make is 22 terabytes, consumers, and we have 23 terabytes or more of data, we're going to have to buy two of those and divide it up, like figure that out on our own. Or we need another NAS that has at least 44 terabytes available. And when we're, if we're going to move 44 terabytes over a gigabyte network, gigabit network, uh, it's going to take days and days and days. So the good news is once you do a full backup of a large data set, I strongly advise you to only do incrementals or file synchronizations for files that have been added, remove files that have been deleted, and update files that have been changed. Some people may choose versioning where it keeps several versions of a file, but this will quickly eat up a lot of drive space in no time, depending on how many versions you choose to keep. One of my customers had their drive set up to have 32 versions of every file. 
So if you can imagine you have a Word document and you're updating it, or an Excel document and you're updating it, and every time you update and save, it's saving the old version along with the new version. So now it's doubled the amount of drive space that one file's taking up. Do it again, now it's triple, quadruple, et cetera, et cetera, up to 32 times for each file. As you can imagine, your 200 gigs of data can suddenly become two terabytes of data with all the versioning being saved. I'm all for versioning, but I would keep it to about three. They might advise no more than six, but to go back six versions seems pretty excessive. You should know <laughs> within a version or two, if you decide, ah, I screwed this up, let me start over from before those most recent changes, right? It's sort of like a system restore for your data. The more versions you want to save, the more space it's going to take up. And that can give you a false impression of how much data you actually have. As I mentioned, you could have 200 gigs of data, for example, but with versioning turned on, it might show you're using two terabytes of data or worse. It could say that you're out of drive space and you're like, wait a minute, it shows I only have 200 gigs. A lot of times it doesn't show the amount of space your versioning has taken up often hidden. And then you got to get into the system properties and things get a little complicated to clear all that out. And I've had end users get in trouble with that when they try and maintain it themselves. And a lot of times what ends up happening, at least for one of my clients, is they paid somebody to set it up. They set it up with 32 versions of every file. I don't know why they did that. And they said, okay, we'll call you if we ever need you. And for five years, the device sat neglected and eventually ran out of space. I mean, it's just a matter of time, no matter how much storage you've got, keep that versioning churned up like that. Regardless of how much data you actually have, you will eventually fill that drive up and the drive no longer will save files. It might even come up with error messages that interfere with the everyday operation of the drive. So maintenance, maintenance is very important. Now, while this drive is synchronizing, we don't have to sit here and wait for it. We should be able to continue to um, explore the operating system and further our configuration. This will probably take about 24 hours for a 22 terabyte drive. The bigger the drive, the longer the synchronization takes. Now, we can close this. I am kind of curious though, what it created. So if we look at the volume, it does show it's BTRFS, which is what I want. And it shows it's synchronizing 20 terabytes. That means it put it in a RAID 1 configuration. That is also what I want. If this was in a RAID 0, then this would be 40 terabytes. But Carrie, I thought you said it was 22. Hard drive manufacturers report the drive size differently than the operating system. It's still the same amount of space. It's like me saying, I have six eggs and the software says I have a half dozen eggs. And you're like, well, which one is it? They're both the same thing. It's the math. All right. So sometimes like I read a review at a, from a supposed PC journalist who was reviewing a drive and said, the drive is, you know, whatever size and then said it's this smaller size after formatting. As though the drive got smaller. <laughs> and when PC journalists propagate this misinformation, it maddens me, angers me. It's maddening. So, you know, I had to write a letter and say, dude, it's your responsibility to educate the public and let them know that that's still the same size, just being reported differently. I don't think the journalists knew. So the good news is, apparently, if you want to be a PC journalist, you don't have any prerequisites to prove you're capable. I guess if you write an, an article that looks pretty good, someone will publish it. I mean, with the internet, you could publish it yourself. But I mean, this was from a respected PC publication, which you know, I expect a higher standard. From. So be aware of that. And Acronis posts an article where Seagate ex explains this difference. As you can imagine, Seagate, Western Digital, and other hard drive manufacturers get inundated with support calls from people who feel they got ripped off. 
because they don't understand the technology. And, you know, who can blame them? What world does it make sense for the number to be reported two separate ways? So if we bring that article up here, would you do me a favor, Mara, and add that link to our video notes? Because whenever I'm trying to find that explanation, I mean, you can Google it, but the quality of the explanation, the clarity of it varies depending on the author. Some people are very, very good at explaining it. Other people, not so much. Uh, Theo Joe also has a, an explanation of it, but I think Theo Joe's explanation is pretty complicated. So if we look here, if I go to my window capture, this is the link about why does my hard drive report less capacity than indicated on the drive's label. And this shows you the different mathematical formulas the operating system is using versus the drive manufacturer. Now, if you're the drive manufacturer, would you want to report the smaller size as advertising your drive or the bigger size? Which math do you want to use? So the drive manufacturers are not lying. When they say it's a 22 terabyte drive, it is, in fact, a true 22 terabyte drive. But when your operating system reports the size of the drive, it's not using the math you and I use. It's using the math computers use, which is, uh, it's, it's a binary base two, which is uh, basically a thousand, and you've heard this before. 1K is 1,000, but in computers, it's 1,024. Well, that's only a difference of 24, which is not a big deal. But when that 1K becomes 100K, 1,000K, which is, by the way, a peg, um, a million K, 24 times a million, suddenly that size differential, it's very, very noticeable the bigger the capacity gets. And hence, the concern. So this looks like they're doing a great job explaining it. Capacity on the product, how Mac OS reports it, and how Windows reports it. Even they don't report it the same. It does look like Mac is reporting it correctly. Windows isn't. And here's the thing. Windows could and sort of does report it both ways. Have you ever noticed, if we go back, let me go back over here. screen. Have you ever noticed if you go to your Windows Explorer and you go to your C drive, we right click and go to properties. And I know most of you have done this before. You're familiar with this screen been around from every version of Windows as far as I know, as far as I can remember. You'll see you get one number over here, right, where it says capacity. But then over to the right, did you ever wonder why they're giving you the same number twice? In other words, the default, I think, for most people is they're just rounding it. But that's not what's happening at all. They're actually giving you the true size of the drive here. And then how Windows reports it internally is here. So they give you both, but they're not really good at clarifying the difference between those two numbers and why there are two numbers there. So now you know. Now, while this is synchronizing, uh, we can go back and look through uh, how this is configured. This is our status of our drives. It appears both drives are functioning as they should. We've got some tabs up here with more details. It shows both drives are normal uh, status. We have our smart status. That's the self-monitoring and reporting technology that lets you know when a drive is starting to fail, if you're lucky enough for it to not just suddenly die without any warning. Then there's something called Iron Wolf Health Management. Not quite sure what that is. It's interesting. Something called Virtual Disk. I don't know what that is. We can plug a USB drive in and expand our storage if we want to. And uh, Hot Spare, which would probably be used in uh, devices that have four or more bays. 
because the OS is the same version of OS that goes on all the TerraMaster devices, I don't really think Hotspare applies in my case. Unless a Hotspare can be connected via USB, but that would be really slow. Something here called Hypercache, which I don't know what it means in this particular case, but there are more expensive NAS devices where you can add an M.2 drive as a cache to make it appear that things are running faster than running. But hey, running faster, who cares, right? If it's a, not really a placebo, it really does run faster. It's just that it's caching it rather than going and grabbing it every time. Now, if we close these out, Again, the synchronization will continue to run in the background. Ah, the security advisor is letting me know my password's terrible and it doesn't like firewall settings. So everything's at the default. We can go back through that. Here in the App Center, there's a ton of apps that you can download and utilize for backing up or creating your own cloud service or having a multimedia server. Uh, you can have cameras security cameras, and rather than paying for the storage for the security camera footage, a lot of security cameras like to sell you that storage as an add-on. Well, this has a surveillance manager where you can be your own storage. This is all about self-reliance, so you're not paying Google Drive or Dropbox for cloud storage. You have your own cloud storage. You're not paying a service like uh, Carbonite for cloud backup when you can create your own cloud backup with the NAS. Your photos, or you don't have to pay a service like iPhoto or Google Photos. Once you exceed a certain amount of photos, you can put as many photos as you want until you run out of drive space. You've already paid for it. You can create your own web page that right to your own. You know, you don't have to go to a uh, a host provider. You can be your own host provider. The Plex Media Server, of course, iSCSI managers, uh, virtualized extended storage. Manager, that's if you want to create multiple volumes and sets. I like to just have all 20 terabytes all in one big lump. I separate everything or segregate everything in folders. I think it's way smarter for me using storage pools, but there may be security reasons why you want to use different storage pools, which again is like creating partitions. So we've got a series of our apps in here, which again, I don't really use any of the apps personally. I just use this as a way to share files across the network. And then I will back this up. Usually what I'll do is I'll put a USB drive on one of the computers on the network and use file synchronization software. Just copy any files that have changed or delete any files that have been deleted and update any files that have been updated. It's way faster to do that. I typically do that weekly. And I do that by hand, although there is a scheduler in the file synchronization software that I use. And there's lots of file synchronization software to choose from, but you're on your own to provide that. Or you can use some of the built-in tools as long as you have another place to put the data. Under the control panel, this is where you're going to have essentially all your configuration settings for everything from setting it up for the network, the file service. This is all related to the drives and storage, including the, uh, well, where we just were with the hypercache and USB drive that can be plugged in, plug in flash drives, et cetera. Um, I believe this will work with a USB wireless. I know the other TerraMaster does, but it's too slow. I don't know why anybody would do that to themselves. The whole idea of having a NAS is to be able to store a bunch of data in one place, which implies, you know, if there's a lot of data, then moving that data to read it back that as quick as possible, wouldn't you? And putting it over Wi-Fi is just too painfully slow. We've got a resource monitor here that lets us know how we're doing with our RAM and uh, processor usage. Well, it's doing that uh, synchronization. The unit is whisper quiet. I barely hear the fan running and I can hear the chatter of the drives from time to time. I wonder how I change that. 
put under system. Region and language is our time zone in Beijing. Didn't I already set that? Want American way. Yeah, that clock was way off. Hardware and power, automatic mode, yes. Oh, it's got a little buzzer, but it's really quiet. Hard drive sleep mode. Some people turn this off uh, on the Synology units. I've had users complaining that when they go to use the NAS after it's essentially when it's gone to sleep, the end users don't know. But all they know is sometimes when they go to access it, it takes it a good 90 seconds to two minutes to respond when they click on it. This is driving me crazy. This two minutes feels like forever when you're just trying to grab a file and go. So adjust that accordingly. You could turn it off entirely. Schedule tasks you can set here. Notifications if you wanted to email you and let you know if the system's been unexpectedly powered off or if a drive has failed or starting to fail or you via email or even uh, SMS messages. And of course, up here, we have a lot of tabs as well, including the security tab. Notifications that you can have. Of course, you've got to configure that with where you want the notifications to go and make sure you have permission to send messages on that server permissions required to avoid people from using it for spam purposes right and then back up here i just was ignoring these tabs early do pay attention that there are menus within the menus All right, so I know we don't change it here. We don't change it. We probably, how much you want to bet? Probably something really simple like right-clicking on the desktop. Let's close this out. Let's right-click, settings, desktop, and there's our wallpaper. Look at that. I just figured that out off the top of my head. I might have done this on the other TerraMaster unit, but I can't remember how I did it. So I'm crediting myself for figuring it out. Should be common sense. There. I, you know, if that was a picture of Odin, I'd leave it. But a pug, it's an ugly dog, man. I'm sorry, but pugs and uh, all those little tiny rat dogs. Los Opsos and... Shih Tzus and, oh, Pekingese are the worst. Sorry if you own one of those dogs. I'm sure they're great. Me, prefer a larger dog. I want a dog that can uh, act as a anti-theft device. All right, so the synchronization will take about 24 hours on a large drive and will take less time uh, on a smaller drive. And what I would do is I would set up a network share. So let's do that now. If we go back over to our control panel, back over to storage settings. I'm kind of curious if it set up a share for us. I suppose the first thing I want to do is I want to give everybody on my network equal access. I don't want to password protect. But at the same time, I'm also not letting anybody in from internet. I'm not going to set up cloud storage or cloud access. By default, that's how it's set up. So if we want to do that, we definitely want to make sure our security is all set up properly before we put the door in that goes to the world. So I'm just setting this up for my local area network access only. If you're on my local area network, as far as I'm concerned, you don't need a username or password to log in. That means we need to turn on the guest account. The guest account is off by default for security reasons. So we'll go back under the App Center under, no, it's not under the App Center. It's under the Control Panel under Users. 
and you'll see that the guest account is not enabled. Should be a way. Groups, admin, all users, media, shared folder. So it looks like it already created a shared folder for us called public. That's exactly how I would have set it up manually. Set up BTRFS. I would have set it up in a RAID 1. And I would have shared a public folder called public. So it's nice to know that's the default because that's my personal default. So back under user, there should be a way here. Ah, when we click on guest, notice this icon right here, the little pen and paper icon how it's shaded out, and then when we click on guest, it becomes available. We click edit, and we want to turn this on. So we'll go to permissions. It's got read write permissions. No quota. Disable the account. We want to enable. So the account's there, it's just not enabled. So I'm trying to figure out where the heck that is. This is if you want to set a password up for the guest account. I want to leave that blank. Interesting that I don't see where not enabled. And this is one of those things, you know, I don't memorize the process because I don't do it that often. You know, how often do you set up a NAS? And once you've set it up, you're good. Like, you don't have to worry about uh, changing your configuration unless something significant is uh, changed in your needs. So for me personally, I like to turn that guest account on and leave it on. Just trying to remember how I did it before. Now, do know that there is a search and we can find, instead of reading documentation traditionally, we can just search for enable guest. Got nothing there. What a thought. That's creating a new account. It's the search. It's the edit. Refresh, what's more? Import, export, advanced. If you don't like the, um, you know, if it's bothering you that your password's not secure, the best way to solve that is to make your password secure. But if you want to be stubborn and leave yourself with an insecure password and turn the notifications off, you can check the box there that, you know, enforces a good password constantly will harass you until you do fix it. So I recommend leaving that. Again, once you get yourself hacked, you're gonna probably never turn that feature. So let's avoid that. That's what I'm saying. Now, the other thing is I wanna go to my shared folders. Let's go back over into the control panel. Look and see if allowing a guest user access to the shared folder is possible. See. Volume, where's it gonna be? Storage pool. That's our T raid. Our drive virtual disk. Should be our volume, I think. Storage pool one, okay. Let's go over here and hit the city up.
I don't see where my volume, um, where my storage volume is. Volume storage pool. Visual data. General setting system info. It must be under shared folder. That's what I've been looking for this whole time. <laughs> right in front of my face. Let's see if we can edit that. Enable the recycle bin. That's an option. Permissions. It says guest has read write access as long as we enable the guest account. So we're all set up as far as the share goes once the guest account is enabled. So I'm good with all that. And if you do use the recycle bin, please remember to empty your recycle bin. I've had customers where they've run out of drive space, and yet again, it, it'll show they're only using a fraction of their capacity, and they don't understand. How can I be out of drive space when I'm only using a fraction of what's available? Because the recycle bin's hidden, and it's consuming, you know, over time, it is consumed. Well, look, don't take the trash out. Most of us have a trash can in our kitchen. Imagine never emptying that. How long would it take before you couldn't even walk in your kitchen? <laughs> well, that's effectively what's happening. It's out of sight, it's out of mind in this case, and so people aren't aware of it. So you would either want to set up a scheduled task where it does it automatically every so often, or you manually empty it time to time. If you're taking up a lot of dry space because your recycle bin has not been emptied in a while, do expect it to take an hour or more to empty out if it's that full. It's not going to just instantly dump millions of gigs of files or hundreds of gigs of files. It will take as much time as needed to empty those files out. And the larger it is, the longer that will take. And so expect that accordingly. Back over to the control panel. Let me go one more time over here to user. It's got to be. I've got to be overlooking it somewhere. Not enabled. Right click maybe? No, right click does nothing. Back over to edit. It should be in here. Password, phone, it's, you know. It's already part of the users group. Permissions. We can deny. If read only access or read write access, that's all set correctly. But where is the option to enable or disable guest account? So here's what I'm going to do cheat a little bit here. Tab Google. I'll say how to enable guest account for just guest Terra Master. See what it says. Go to control panel, select guest, and click edit. That's where I was to make the guest user status normal and restart the SMB service. Seeing that. Is there see anything about status? When we deal with security settings, it's important that the security is taken seriously. If they make everything really easy to bypass, then your security is not going to be that good. The fact that I'm stumbling here figuring this out is for two reasons. One, because it deals with security. It's not obvious and in my face, but two, my lack of familiarity with TOS, right? I've had more familiarity with Synology and I can get through this because I've done it more times. This is only my second time working with the TerraMaster unit. So um, still becoming familiar with TOS. And once again, this is something I only do once during the initial setup. So bear with me as we learn this together. But it should be here in this page somewhere. And I think those directions are for a different version.
And now a lot of people are referring over here to SMB. So SMB is our protocol that we would use to access over the Windows network. And that's typically under the network section. So when we go to control panel, you'll see we have a whole section under network file service. You'll see we have SMB here. SMB file service, name of our work group. This is important if you want to be able to browse your network with other computers browsing the network and you want to be able to see your NAS that way. I typically map a network drive rather than manually browse every time. But you better make sure if you want to be able to find it on your network through browsing that you're on the same work group name. You can name this anything you want. But you need to make sure all the computers and devices on your network that you want to be able to see each other through browsing doesn't affect access. It just affects whether or not it appears when browsing are going to share the same exact work group. And you will see some options here for Mac OS. Doesn't benefit me at all. And then we've got some other services, which I don't care about right now. So I'm going to leave all this alone. FTP, which I'm not going to use. You can have your own file transfer protocol service for having an FTP server, an rsync server, and then the web dev server as well. If you're into that sort of thing. I'd shared folders from users without permissions. Well, that's interesting. So I wonder if I uncheck that box. Now, obviously, if we're going to allow internet access to this, then that is something we're going to definitely want turned on. I'm just kind of curious. Turn that off. Now, let me go back over to my desktop here. Let's go to File Explorer. Actually, let me minimize this. Let's close this. I'm going to go to my computer right up here. And I'm going to say right here under this PC. No, it's not there. Where is the map network drive? There, map network drive. We could browse and we should find it on the network in theory. And likely it's not showing up because I don't think I have the file discovery service turned on on this mini PC. I think that's what's happened. So if I type in the name of the NAS along with the name of the share, that would go right in here under folder. And I've already forgotten <laughs> the name of the NAS. Oh, this is going smoothly, isn't it? So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that my permissions for networking are all turned on. This is where people run into frustration when you're trying to home network because the default is to keep people out, right? And you want to set it up so that only the people you want in get in. We're going to go to the settings here in Windows, go over to our network and internet settings, and we want to set up advanced network settings down here. Advanced sharing settings. We want to turn network discovery on and file and printer sharing on. Now, in theory, if I want to browse my network, give it just a second here, with sets. If I want to browse my network, I hope we see the NAS. I see the monitor I use. And this may require a reboot. It may even require a reboot of the NAS to reinitial. The other thing I can do, I like to name the server, server, quite frankly, because it's very easy for me to remember. So I can go in here to the settings. Remember when we were in the control panel under the device where I showed you, we can give the device a name. That was under, was it general settings? No, 
No, I was just there a minute ago. Right here, device name. What I'll do, even though this is not a server, I'll call it a server because we're using it as a file server, not as a proper business server, but just as a file server. So with that done, now I know the name. So to access it, I can go whack, whack, right? Backslash, backslash, server. That's the name of the NAS. And then public is the name of the share. And if I have guest access enabled, it should let me in. It doesn't appear to be letting me in. I'm just kind of curious. And I realize I am doing this the hard way. Documentation is there for a reason, folks. Uh, but I've set up these NASs of different manufacturers. And, well, they don't all follow the same processes. They all offer the same or similar features. How you activate them varies from one to the next. And, again, I might need to reboot to have the changes I made. No, I have to enable this account. It's killing me. <laughs> Description, new password, custom password, security email. Where did they hide it? Definitely want read write access. This is referring to deny access. You see how it's right out here. I wonder if that's because the account is this. Oh, that didn't do it. Frank Jimmy says to uncheck disable guest account. Where did we see that? Was that under um, that's what I'm looking for. It, what section of the control panel is that? It's clearly not under user. Is it under network? So I'm going to go ahead and turn that feature back on because that did not help us. And that could come back to bite us in the butt later. So I want to absolutely make sure. Turned on. Let me go under advanced here. As soon as the screen brightens up there, it's finished. Nope, it's not useful. We want to enable the UPnP discoveries. Uh, Windows discovery is good enough. I don't need Bonjour because I don't use Mac, so I can turn that off. Frank says to go back to users in the control panel. User. Edit the user account. Okay, following Frank Jimmy's directions here in our live chat. Go to advanced settings, disable this user account. That's what I've been looking for this whole time. Thank you, Frank. I don't know why I didn't see that before. There you go. Got to pay attention, Carrie. All right. Now, if I go down here and do server backslash public, it opens up this file share. In this file share, if we map a drive letter to it, let's see. I go to this computer icon here. 
app and network drive, I call it drive Z. The reason I call it drive Z is anytime you plug a USB drive in, it's going to take the next available drive letter. I used to call it drive G back in the 90s. And what ended up happening is between memory card readers and USB drives, started overlapping drive letters and they get drive letter conflict. That's when I realized I need to go all the way to the end of the alphabet to reduce the odds of that ever happening because it resulted in a support call. We can't have two drive G's. And it was really weird, like with a memory card reader, if it's taking up, you know, if the memory card reader has six different memory cards it reads, you get six drive letters. And so if your last drive letter is D because of your optical drive, right, your C drive, your D drive, that was very common, then you'd have E, F, it would have to skip over G, and sometimes it wouldn't with XP, it would overlap and two G's, H, I, J, and I would have to shift everything down manually in the control panel. And it would eventually, after an update, go back and do it again. So I just go to the Z drive. Now, if I hit browse, will I see it now? Still not seeding in browse. I imagine maybe a reboot is required. However, since I know how to access it, I'll just do it manually here by typing backslash backslash server backslash public enter. And that's going to open a new browser um, explorer window no differently than any other storage device. So now when we go to our yellow folder or the computer, we now under this PC have another drive attached. Now imagine every device in your house, every computer having access to the Z drive. Everybody sees all the same files. Imagine how useful that can be share documents, you want to share photos. Obviously, things like a television wouldn't necessarily need access, but if you had a fire stick, for example, plugged into your television, or your TV has a, a media player built into it, you can then browse the network to this Z drive. Now, obviously, it wouldn't be the Z drive on the TV. You would browse the network, find the quote-unquote server, the name we gave it, click on that, and then click on any shared folders that are enabled with guest access. And you'll see it did not require us to put in a name or a password. So it's very easy to get access quickly. And you will save files to this no differently than you would to your C drive. And frees up space on your C drive. Um, I think that's about as far as we need to take this for today. We'll let this continue to run overnight so it can synchronize those drives. Uh, I can go ahead and reboot this now because even though it's synchronizing, when we shut down and log out of uh, Windows, the machine continues to run its processes in the background. So let's do an update and restart. We'll kill two birds with one stone here. And when it restarts, I'm just curious about the whole browsing the network thing because it should painlessly be very easy to network and browse the network. I I don't have the patience for browsing the network, so I always map a drive letter so I have instant access to it. But some people, you know, they have the habit of wanting to browse and manually go discovering the device, and they don't realize it's what they're doing. They should go using the machine to discover what's on the network and accessing it that way. And I found that even when that works, it doesn't work consistently. Uh, it usually works most of the time, but from time to time, you could have... Um, master browser errors and things like that that may cause or require a reboot of some device that's trying to be the master browser at the same time. Other device is trying to be drive people mad. <laughs> anyway, just map a network drive to it and be done with it. Let me now, let me go full screen on here now. It was a fast reboot, wasn't it? It's PC, back. network. Okay, well, I'm seeing the router, television. So now what I'm concerned about is we may need to reboot the NAS device. Now that we've configured it, we want all those configuration settings to take effect, and it may require a reboot. Now we can reboot one of two ways. I can just press the power button and release it in the back, and if you listen, we should hear a confirmation beep. It's very subtle. Now, what that's going to do is it's just like shutting down Windows. It's going to shut down 
all of the active processes, including that synchronization that's happening, not to worry, it will pick up synchronization when it restarts again. But we're going to go ahead and shut this down. And much like Windows, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds or so to close out all the, open, the services that are running. And I'll know when it's shut down because the fan in the back will stop spinning. But you'll be able to tell because all those lights will go off. Normally, this thing would be on 7. Uh, and it would reboot anytime there's OS updates or there might be app updates that require a reboot. Okay, so the fan has stopped. We'll go ahead and turn it back on. Should get a beep. Or we'll get a beep when it's ready. Again, much like Windows, it takes us time to take some time to load the operating system up. And as I mentioned, because it was synchronizing when we shut it down, it will pick up the synchronization and continue it automatically. You don't have to. And thank you again, Frank, Jimmy, for uh, <laughs> helping me see what was right in front of me. Gerardo, or yeah, Gerardo Quintana Roo is now a member for 19 months, renews his membership today. He says, happy holidays to all. Thank you for renewing your membership and your support, and happy holidays to you, my friend. And Peter contributed a euro. Thank you, Peter. Ben Laird contributed two pounds. It says, hello from Scotland, and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Ben. Jeb with a $5 super chat I missed earlier. Merry Christmas, he says. I sent a small gift via PayPal to you along with what will become a future gift for a community member in need. Keep it live. Ooh, gonna have to check my email here. Thank you for that, Jeb. I'm waiting to hear a beep from this. It does take about a minute or two. That's pretty typical of all NASAs. Ah, $15. Merry Christmas, and thank you for the infinite amount of sage advice and wisdom, along with the constant authenticity that is far too uncommon these days. Please keep it up. Yes, I have a B-Link 3550H I need to send you for someone among the community in need. You know, what we ought to do, uh, this is from Jeb in North Carolina. Instead of having you send me the unit to the West Coast and then have me sending it back to the East Coast, which where most of the giveaways go, hold on to it. We'll do the giveaway and I'll send you the user's infor uh, shipping information. You can ship it directly to the viewer. How does that sound? That'll also reduce the likelihood of any damage occurring. And I mean, unless you want me to go through it and you know reinstall everything and tune it up. Otherwise, if it's in good shape and it's ready to rock and roll, cut the middleman out, and I can just help facilitate the the transfer of ownership. That'd be great. And the B Link unit is a great unit. I would just. Uh, Using the SER5 yes, uh, last night, I was going through it. In fact, I have it right here as I was writing all the stats down on it. Small world. Let's go to the network now and see, since we've rebooted this, I think we'll see. Network. Hmm. It's not even seeing itself. So I wonder, well, I'll tell you what, what would Carrie do? I have a software tool called Uncle Carrie's Network Fix. Windows has a lot of services and permissions because of the security involved in networking. But if you don't get them exactly right, if you just miss one of them, it won't, it won't work or part of it won't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load my own utility, and this is why my utility exists. Now, 
I haven't tested it on Windows 11, so let's see what happens. Now you'll see, even though it's when we're browsing the network and we're not finding it, it's still, you do see the Z drive is there and you can access it. And if I wanted to, I could take all the files off this flash drive. I could copy them, check this out, and I can put them on my Z drive. Like I can make, uh, make a new folder called Utilities. So if you think about it, I could get access to my utilities right over my network to any connected computer without using the flash drive. We just transfer that right over the network and it's going to take all the files off that flash drive and put it into this directory here on this drive. And you'll see those Windows security settings for networking are one thing for sharing and another thing for browsing. And that's usually the browsing one that people have problems with. And if you don't know how to manually go to the network share, like I just demonstrated with the backslash backslash. If you don't know how to do that, then people think they've got no access when in fact they do. They just don't have browsing capability. So I made this utility with the help of uh, D7X Tech, which was really intended for Windows 10. And it's called Uncle Carrie's Netfix. And the settings should be identical from Windows 10 and 11. So if we scroll down here, we can just do this while it's copying. It's 10 Netflix, copy that. What's that? Click, yes. And it's gonna set all these defaults up, uh, giving us the ability you know, to see what our work group name is in case you don't know how to find it, what our computer name is in case you don't know how to find it and check all the boxes that we need to have in order for networking to work the way I want it to work properly. So I just hit apply and it's gonna do everything for us instead of manually going through all these different settings one by one by one, which can be very time consuming. This does it for you, which ensures you're not forgetting anything and it's doing it much faster. Now, obviously for this to take effect, we are gonna to have to reboot the mini PC. So in order to do that, I'm going to interrupt this process because I just was demonstrating. It's not important that I have that server. Let's go ahead and reboot. And in theory, if my tool did the trick, and this is live, in theory, we should see the NAS when we browse. The tool, the link for this tool should be in the video notes below this video, and it's available from D7X Tech, it's like 10 bucks, so it's really cheap. And there's no security on it. So once you have it, you're free to use it on as many PCs as you want in perpetuity, provided it's compatible. Like, I don't know that it'll work on future versions of Windows. I'm not even positive it works on Windows 11, but I feel like it should because Windows 11 and Windows 10 are so similar. They didn't, Microsoft didn't really change Let's go to my computer here to network. Five. Ah, well now I'm stumped. We do have to make sure when you're browsing that on the NAS side of things, right? You've got the PC side of things. So I know all of that set up correctly now. Now on the NAS side of things, we need to verify that's all set up correct. So we definitely want the Windows Discovery Service turned on if you want to be able to browse for it. And now back in the day, Synology was leaving that off by default. So I made a video showing people with Synologies how to turn that on. And it became like a really super popular video. I had no idea how many people Synologies. But now that's turned on by default on future versions of Synology's OS, and it looked like it was turned on here. So I'm still a little confused to what I'm missing. So 
but we should be good to go with regards to our mini PC configuration for networking. So it's got to be on the NAS side that I'm missing something. So let's go back over to the NAS again to find it. We'll use the utility from TerraMaster because I can't remember. Finds it here. Click. Click. Login. <laughs> hey, when I set that password, it's going to screw myself up. Did I capitalize carry? I don't think I did. Ah, I guess I did. All right, so now we're logged in, and on the login screen, that's pretty cool that we see our stats. Our use space, our free space, address, our upstream and downstream of data, CPU usage, and memory usage currently. And that's using, I guess, this utility. Okay, so back into the device, back over to network. Same. It's going to be under SMB. And one. This is the section for Wi Fi. Again, if you really want to slow this thing down so it's painfully slow. You can buy a compatible Wi-Fi device. Uh, I think there's one chipset it's compatible with, not the latest standard. So it's going to be slow. It's possible. File service, that's what I want. Okay, so SMB, enable SMB, yes. Work group is work group. SMB2, SMB handles. Does it support SMB3? So all this other stuff that doesn't apply to us, it's just this first tab here, this enable SMB. Oh, it's gotta be under advanced maybe, is that? The wind server, okay, here we go. Minimum version SMB1, I would definitely not allow SMB1. That's crazy. That is so insecure. I can't believe that they're offering that. If you're still running an old obsolete version of Windows, or you have an old NAS that requires SMB1, SMB1 was turned off in Windows through an update several years ago. And while it's possible to turn it back on, you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you we can enable the local master browser. We talked about that. And let's hit apply. Once again, it may require a reboot for these changes to take effect, although we'll give it a shot here just to see if that makes a difference. Okay, finally, the computer sees itself. See, it just took a minute. So that's a good sign. I was just being impatient, I guess. 
and then I guess we have to reboot. So aside from using the power button, we can go up here to the user icon, choose restart here, confirm, and this will go through the restart, which they're saying for the, for the shutdown process and then the power up process, allow five minutes. All right, so while we wait, and this is gonna be my last test, because this, if this doesn't work, it may just be something that I'm just being too impatient on that it may appear in the network browsing section after it's Windows. Not exactly sure how the master browsing takes effect. I've seen computers where it takes effect immediately, and I've seen other computers where it takes, you know, upwards of 20 minutes for everything to propagate properly, which to me doesn't make sense on a LAN. It should be instantaneous, but it is what it is. So while that's processing, if there's any last questions that I can answer for you, I'd be happy to do my best to provide an answer. As you can see, for $170 for a NAS, it's not exactly limiting you. I've seen some entry-level NASs that don't offer BTRFS. They make you pay for the more expensive version. I've seen entry-level NASs that don't allow you to use drives over a certain size. And these are marketing limitations, not technical limitations, to get you to open your wallet and spend more for the more expensive model. Speaking of charging more for the more expensive model, what speed network does this have? Because as we well know, most all NASs these days are gonna come with two and a half gig networking by default, but there are many from a popular manufacturer that are being sold with just one gig networking, which is, it's been a standard for a long, long time. It's been 20 years. So going to two and a half gig now is very affordable. And in my opinion, all NAS devices by default should be at two and a half gig if new devices that you're buying. So out of curiosity, because this is entry level, just kind of curious if that's another marketing limitation that potentially could be in effect here. Let me go back over to Amazon page and just take a quick look at what they say here. on page turn on capture so I can share that with you the one gig of RAM is not upgradable I think that's an important note here because this is an entry level so we can see they've made a, a marketing decision there it's not a technical decision We see anything about the performance? Oh, it just beeped. So, we see anything about the performance of the network? It's one gig. Okay, so this is pretty typical on entry level. Again, not a technical limitation. This is a marketing thing. So they want you to, you know, if you want the NAS that you can upgrade the RAM on, and NAS that can have the two and a half gig networking, and you need to go to the next model up. These are more demanding um, requirements that typically advanced users would look for. Most novices wouldn't know the difference one way or the other. And so this is a great starter NAS to determine just how useful a NAS would be to you. It's very, very affordable. And the good news is, if you do want to upgrade it down the road, you can recycle these drives, take them out, move them into your new NAS. And if it's a TerraMaster NAS, you probably don't even have to reformat them. Just literally slide them into the new NAS and you're good to go. Pretty painless upgrade. Now, if you change manufacturers, different story. But even if you buy a, a, a four drive NAS, you can just put the two drives in it and it'll work just fine. Okay, this is 20 seconds remaining. And I'm just kind of curious to see this yet on the 
let that sit there for a minute <clears throat> and we'll take a look here at what's going on in the chat room. Jeb wants to know, if we wanted to set up an NVMe uh, NAS, are we pretty much forced into the ASUS store? Uh, no. In fact, I'm not really caring for the ASUS store. I'm a little disappointed with the um, responsiveness. And when I go to access it via my, my uh, flash fire stick, rather, when I exit and go back in, it will let me back in. Whereas with TerraMaster, that I'm using the previous model to this one. It's super responsive. I can go in and out, in and out, in and out. Cat. <laughs> it doesn't complain. And I still don't know why we're not seeing this. However, um, looks like, oh, so we have, not only do we have a wallpaper to change, but the login screen. Great. Somebody really likes this pug. All right, let's, oh, darn it. Can I go back? I guess I need to check the box to stay signed in. So I need to go back to the user. How do I change that to capital C? Normally, logins are not case sensitive, only passwords. But in this case, I guess for security reasons, they're case sensitive on login name and the password. Okay, so the NVMe NAS that I use personally, I've demonstrated here, is the QNAP. Now, it's expensive, and I don't know why, other than because they can. Um, go to Amazon. Type in QNAP NVMe. And it's this device, the TBS-464, that only allows for four um, M.2 drives. However, it includes heat sinks for all four drives. It's also a Celeron processor, which, you know, is much more powerful than like the ARM processors, et cetera. And uh, has two and a half gig networking. It's really small. And if you go to YouTube, check this out. Go to YouTube, type in Kerry Holzman, one word, and then QNAP. You can watch my review on this that I did back in October. My father founded St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because he believed no child should. In. I usually hear yeah. Um, I like that better than the Nothing ever store. breaks. Why are yeah, we and I paying think Mara you? agrees. Which is what they were doing. Or everything, you know, if you heard her in the background. The ASUS store has promise, though, and I think with some operating system updates, it has the potential to be better than the QNAP. But right now, given the current status, I think the QNAP is superior. Also, the ASUS store only runs the M.2 drives at 1,000 megabytes per second. So you're wasting money if you're putting in expensive M.2 drives that are fast because you're not going to use more than by one speeds. The QNAP will do by two speeds. So it's 2,000 megabytes per second per stick. So your potential for speed is actually faster on the QNAP with a faster processor than the ASUS. And... Um, they're both, the operating systems are both about equally mature. The downside with the ASUS store is you still get the same operating system as their hard drive NAS. So there's some features like defragmentation that exist in the software that should not be there on an NVMe NAS. But because they've carried it over from, it's not even so much they carried it over, they didn't change anything to modify it for NVMe use. So they just lazily said same OS. You fragment your NVMe, nothing stops you. That's a great way to kill your NVMe drive early. So in my opinion, that feature should not be there. Hmm. And this will remain a puzzle, but I'll have to figure out as to 
I mean, we should always, when you're browsing your network, you should always see your own computer. I mean, unless you've got the, sh the sharing on it disabled. And speaking of what, I want to go back over to the Z drive and delete that directly. Just give you an example of how this works. You'll notice it had a red X on it initially because it wasn't connected, right? Because we had rebooted. But as soon as you double click on it, it should reconnect. And if I go to utilities, right click, put it in the trash can, it will go into the recycle bin. That's why I say if you don't have any task to automatically empty the recycle bin, you can fill your NAS up, even though it may show very limited data actually in use, because there's the data that's available to you. And then, of course, there's, there's what's in the recycle bin, which in some cases that I've seen the recycle bins, you know, multiple times larger in capacity than the actual amount of data the customer has. I don't think we can empty it this way, can we? Open it that way. Sometimes you got to be an admin. Yeah. So to empty the recycle bin, what we would do is either create a task to say after a certain amount of time, automatically empty. Or if you want to do it by hand, probably in the file service, is it? Share folder. Click. Edit. Empty recycle bin right down here. Click that button. That frees that space back up for us to use it for other things. And you know, when you've got 22 terabytes to use, that's no big deal. But if you're really using it a lot, really taking advantage of the fact that you have a NAS, as I do, that space becomes more and more precious the more you use it. All right, so I think that is gonna wrap it up for today's video. Peter wants to know, can you convert an old PC into a NAS? You can, I don't recommend it. If you go back to the very beginning of the video, I talked about why you should not do that and the downsides of doing that. So for the sake of not repeating myself, I'll encourage you to go back and watch from the beginning. We did cover that pretty in depth early on. Nick Caffrey says, Carrie says his episodes are live. He comes across the same glitches we all do. Yeah, well, that's the whole point of doing this, right? Because we, Z says my computer is a public network. Oh, I don't have it on a private network. I thought my utility changed that, but that's a good catch, Z. Let me, uh, let me address that real quick. Good catch there, my friend. Let's get that in there. Let's go back to settings. Network and internet. No, it's on private network. See, when I run my um, Netflix tool, I believe my Netflix tool changes that. You definitely want to be on a private network for file sharing. Public network would be like if you're tell or coffee shop, you don't want people to be able to access your drive because you wouldn't know it was happening potentially. Firewall and security setting. Yeah, I mean, in theory, this should have all the permissions set correctly. So it was a good suggestion, something I didn't check manually. I appreciate that. However, something else I'm missing, and it's probably something simple. I'm not too worried about it. As I mentioned, we have full access with the map drive letter. It's just the whole browsing thing. It's one of those things that relates, uh, re results in a lot of support calls, right? With people wanting to browse their network. And I always discourage them from doing that because even when you do get it working, it can be finicky. Sometimes the reason browsing doesn't work is the router needs to be rebooted. And that's a silly reason to reboot a router that's otherwise working great. And that could be, my situation here for all I know. And I don't wanna disconnect everything online during a live video to try that, it's not that important. But uh, I think that router's been on now for 
nearly a year without a reset. So it's probably new. And it's certainly uh, any network switches that you've got between your computer and your router, including the router, as part of the diagnostic of just getting browsing to work. Plugging them, wait a minute, plug them back in. Fun stuff just to browse. All right, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I hope everybody has a great Christmas Eve. And I hope you have a wonderful Christmas day. Whether or not you celebrate the holiday, I hope it turns out to be a great day for you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back after the holiday. I've got some great content lined up for you this coming week with uh, our big build that's coming up on Friday, which I hope you'll join us for. I've got more with Acronis. I want to talk some more about that as we get to the end of the year. This is a great time to talk about and remind people the importance of backups. If you've been procrastinating, start off the new year with some peace of mind knowing you've got a backup. I've already demonstrated how to download the free trial and use it to make your backup. You can restore that backup and you don't even have to buy a Cronus. You can download that trial, make your backup, and if you ever need to restore that backup, a Cronus allows the restore regardless if you have an active license or not. This is pretty generous of them. So, well, I've focused on making the backup. I need to then move on to how to do the restore. So I think coming up this week, we'll do a sample restore. Maybe we'll image like this mini PC, for example. Wipe it completely clean or put an entirely new drive in it that's totally blank. Restore the image and show you how it goes right back exactly bit for bit. Same wallpaper, same icons, same everything, same programs all gets moved over and how fast it is, way faster than reinstalling, including any activations for most software will carry over and stay active as long as we're not changing the system we're restoring on. So with that, I think it'll wrap it up. Thank you for your uh, help, Mara, and the amazing thumbnail used in today's video. And of course, thanks to Acronis for hanging out with us all stream. Thank you, Acronis, we'll see you later this week. Merry Christmas to everybody. We will see you again before the new year. And what's the deadline for Acronis? We're right now Acronis has a special where it's 50% off. That's their special, not ours. Our discount is 30%. So right now their discounts better. Take advantage of it because at the end of the year, it goes back to full price. So when people watch this video, for example, for the very first time in 2024, and they're like, oh, I missed out, do know that we have a coupon code good for all of 2024 that'll save you 30% off for both new purchases and renewals of license, uh, license renewal, subscription renewals for Acronis or any Acronis product on the site. Well, of course, we'll talk more in depth on that uh, in the weeks, in the days and weeks ahead. All right. And uh, thank you for all the super chat contributions. Once again, a, a shout out and thank you. Let me check the phone first because I always forget to do this. So let me do it right and say thank you to Jeb, to Frank Jimmy, to Mark Gaines, Luke Greenia, our friend Buster, Peter Laycock, and Frankie B. Frankie B sent a very very generous Amazon gift card. Thank you so, so much, Frankie. That's very kind. Uh, Netfreak, thank you for the Amazon gift card. And Mortant, thank you as well for the Amazon gift card. Hopefully I got everybody. And then on the Super Chats, let's shout out and thank you. to Peter VZ for multiple Super Chats today. Thank you so much for that. Thank you to Jeb for your Super Chat and Gregory Howard, Planet Cryos, Richard, Mark Gaines, Ryan, Steve H and Steve Mercure, our friend Buster again, uh, multiples from Planet Cryos, thank you again. Planet Krauss, be sure and check out his YouTube channel. He's got 
He's got the AM5 live mixer build already done. That's what we've got coming out. Although our build is entirely different, but we're using the same mother. And thank you also for all your memberships and for renewing memberships like uh, Geraldo Quintana Roo did now 18 months. And uh, your contributions and support, support keeps us independent. So we're not uh, hawking products at you, but instead I am reviewing products that I'm genuinely interested in. For full disclosure, TerraMaster sent us this unit free of charge but we are free to speak our mind about it. We're not obligated to say anything or to not say anything. TerraMaster is that confident that we're going to like their product and I think they're right. What's not to like at that $170 price point, it makes having a NAS approachable and attainable for pretty much anybody with a computer now. So it's a great way to have a large amount of storage. I know people that have multiple hard drives in their computer. I've seen people with eight to 10 hard drives. And they might be older, like, you know, smaller capacity, and they just figure, let's use it because it's, it's there. And, you know, they can, they're consuming so much electricity running these drives. The drives are old, they're not reliable, and they don't hold much. These days, it doesn't make any sense when large capacity drives are so inexpensive. You don't have to go 22 terabytes. You could go with a couple of four terabyte drives. And it might exceed the capacity of, of the eight drives that are, you know, 10 years plus old in some tower computer you've got. And then everything's segregated into different drive letters and it's just a big mess. It simplifies everything. And once you go this direction, you'll never want to go back to that. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you, Mara. You're welcome. Thanks to all of you for watching. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you on, what, Wednesday? Are we back on Tuesday or Wednesday? Oh, uh, members, I will be live tomorrow on Christmas Day for members only. Thank you so much for watching. And for members, I will see you. Hopefully, I'll see you tomorrow, Christmas Day. Until next time, bye for now. Looking for an outro. Merry Christmas.